Hello, my name is Megan Kammer, and I'm the Assistant Curator at the Visual Arts Center of Clarington. Thank you for joining me virtually today as we explore the VAC's new public sculpture initiative curated by Matthew Kaiba from The Earth We Grow. It is my pleasure to be sharing this exhibition with you. I hope this message finds you well. To begin, I'd like to acknowledge the Visual Arts Center of Clarington's presence on the traditional territory of the Mississaugas of Scugog Island First Nation. Clarington, Ontario is situated on treaty land that is steeped in rich Indigenous history and home to many First Nation, Inuit, and Métis people. Our work on these lands acknowledge the signatory communities of the Williams Treaties. We also recognize the significance of the Dish with One Spoon Wampum Belt Covenant and offer our respect to our Anishinaabe, Haudenosaunee, and Miti neighbors as we strive to strengthen our relationships with them. I personally believe this acknowledgement is a crucial statement for us as a cultural and municipal institution. A land acknowledgement confronts the ongoing effects of colonialism that underpin our history in Canada. Not only have cultural institutions employed deeply colonial methods of representation, many of which I will be touching on in this recording, but because of our authority, these narratives have often eclipsed Indigenous histories, have been accepted as truth, and informed various practices in our sector and beyond. A land acknowledgement holds us accountable to work towards meaningful change and to implement recommendations from the Truth and Reconciliation Commission. It is also an important reminder that we are all treaty partners. I recognize that support for this change can look like many things, including work within our institution to dismantle systemic racism and advocate for Indigenous rights to land, language, representation, and culture. I believe these acknowledgements are not to commemorate the past, but to recognize our ongoing commitment to the present and the future. They are living and will continue to live in all of us. If you are not familiar with us, the Visual Arts Center of Clarington, or the VAC, is a not-for-profit public art gallery and art education center located in Bowmanville, Ontario. The organization was incorporated in 1976 with the mission of delivering contemporary art to the Clarington community, the wider Durham region, and beyond. The VAC has a 45-year history of community engagement, connecting people of all ages and backgrounds in a creative place for art making and learning. Over the past five years, we at the gallery have been working on exciting new projects and community-focused initiatives to broaden our engagement with contemporary art beyond Canada allowing us to support locally focused, though often transnational conversations with artists and creators working across our world today. One of these projects includes our new public sculpture initiative, From the Earth We Grow, which opened to the public on site here at the gallery on October 12th, 2021. This project presents free outdoor art installations on the VAC grounds until September 2022, and hopefully in many more iterations to come. There is a common tendency within a nation's history books to omit important stories and achievements of historically marginalized communities. For example, in the case of outdoor Canadian sculptures, these objects most commonly marry historical references with artistic interpretation to manifest freely experienced, though often colonial monuments. These objects typically promote Eurocentric and or Western mythologies that preserve figures of empire, as well as their historical authority. This practice has eclipsed the histories of many marginalized communities in North America and now prevents meaningful knowledge sharing as we experience a form of public amnesia, a sort of forgetting of BIPOC histories, experiences, and activism in Canada. With this in mind, curator Matthew Kaiba invited three artists who use little known or ignored histories of Canada's diverse communities as inspiration for site-specific sculptures on our public grounds. Taking inspiration from these untold or off-ignored BIPOC events within Canadian history, these three artists, local Bowmanville-based Anouk artist Cousine Van Heuvelen, Montreal-based artist Anna Binta Diallo, and Richmond, Virginia-based artist Sandy Williams IV, have created three critical and interactive public outdoor sculptures that respond to ignored histories within Canada's diverse communities. Let's dive into Anna Binta Diallo's male and female figures holding child. Diallo is a multidisciplinary Canadian artist who investigates memory and nostalgia as a way to create unexpected narratives surrounding identity, or the construction of identity. 
Diallo was born in Dakar, Senegal, but spent most of her childhood in St. Boniface, Winnipeg. She received her BFA from the University of Manitoba's School of Fine Arts and her MFA from the Transart Institute in Berlin. Her work has been shown across Canada and internationally. After having her work with us for a solo exhibition in our gallery a few years ago, we're happy to welcome Diallo's sculptural work back to our outdoor garden space. She currently lives and works in Montreal. To get a good idea of what these sculptures mean in Clarington, I think it's helpful to learn more about some of Diallo's earlier artworks. One of her most well-known exhibition series is titled Wanderings. In Wanderings, Diallo wanted to use the archive as a way to explore how identity becomes history, or rather how images and visual representations can shape how we remember people as individuals and communities. In this way, Diallo criticizes Western history and philosophy as something that is falsely presented as complete, that our textbooks do not tell us the whole story, that there is not one way of knowing, and our identities are not single, singular, but varied and dispersed. For Black communities in particular, identity is often something that is entirely undocumented because of colonial practices of documenting information. Mandeek Mohammed, a Toronto-based cultural writer, reflecting on Black archival practices, once stated, we know that the archive will never be sufficient. If we are accounted for, it is via the violence of fact, scientific racism, and catalogs listing enslaved peoples as anonymous property. Perhaps not knowing can be useful insofar as it allows for a recognition of the fact that what is slash isn't archived is but one of many fictions that constitutes blackness in public life, unquote. And so Diallo primarily works in collage with these references in mind to explore alternative ways of documenting black bodies that are otherwise insufficiently documented throughout history. Each figure that you see in Wanderings can be viewed as a sort of folktale archetype, a visual constellation of missed histories, media, and other lost narratives. These are non-identified figures, figures of public amnesia. But they are also open to interpretation, unlike the historical figures you typically study in a textbook or archive. So Diallo creates these mythical figures and mystical bodies as stand-ins for those who have been missed in the documentation of North American history. She is turning photographic facts from the archive into this new, expansive folklore that includes otherwise forgotten individuals. On this project, Diallo writes, Casting a wide net on our collective history, I reinterpreted folk stories and reimagined or reused them in my own way to create new mythologies, using archives, books, found imagery, the internet, memory, and oral traditions, I created a series of new images that can be continually reorganized, remnants of a various cultural inheritance." Unquote. Diallo continues this work in her new sculptures on site at the VAC. Through cutting, pasting, and splicing photographs, Diallo builds new fictions that upend linear narratives, privileged by colonial histories. In these works, Diallo is pulling archival material and found imagery from local archives to map out an active role that Black bodies have made in building our country. Agricultural laborers, industrial workers, and most importantly, often understudied Black activists. Among these figures includes folks like Bromley Armstrong. Armstrong was a trade unionist, civil rights leader, and community organizer who helped shape race relations in Canada throughout the last century. Armstrong came to Canada from Jamaica in the late 1940s and left a lasting mark on his home province of Ontario. Becoming a strong voice in the fight to improve civil rights and labor laws, he was a pivotal figure in early anti-discrimination campaigns that led to Canada's first anti-discrimination laws, a self-described blood and guts ally of the working poor. For more than six decades, Armstrong worked for human rights, helping to generate civic and government support for racial equality and advocated for human rights reform and public policy. He participated in Toronto-based sit-ins throughout the 1950s to combat local businesses' refusal of services to Black Canadians. He helped restructure automotive trade workers' unions in Ontario and was an outspoken leader in the reformation of the National Black Coalition of Canada. His efforts earned him the Order of Ontario and the Order of Canada. 
Another figure that I think about in relation to this sculpture is Jean Augustine. Augustine is a trailblazing politician, social activist, and educator. She is the first African-Canadian woman to be elected to the House of Commons, and the first African-Canadian woman to be appointed to the federal cabinet. Born in 1937 in Happy Hill, Granada, Augustine overcame personal and economic adversity from an early age to excel academically, and began her career as a teacher. After arriving in Canada in 1960, she participated in grassroots organizations to strengthen minority and women's rights and served her community in the city of Toronto with great passion and charisma. Augustine carried her grassroots convictions and community values with her into public service, education, and advocacy as she entered politics and became a member of parliament in 1993. In 1995, her proposed motion to recognize February as Black History Month passed unanimously. Although I think we can all agree today that Black Canadian history should be celebrated year-round, not just once a year, Augustine's impact is undeniable, establishing lasting traditions that honour the important contributions of Black Canadians to our culture, development, and heritage. Anna Binta Diallo hopes to reinscribe the legacy of these figures and their peers in our public memory, sharing their stories in this mythological way to promote the dissemination of Black history in Canada, a reference to otherwise forgotten leaders and active figures that should be celebrated more often across our nation. The second installation, and from the earth we grow, is a new living monument constructed by the American artist and art educator, Sandy Williams IV. Williams received their MFA from Virginia Commonwealth University and is currently still based in the state working as an assistant professor at the University of Richmond. Their work often focuses on the persistence of memory, the body, and resistance. They often give the audience agency over their creations, generating public opportunities for collaborative engagement and participation in their installations as they welcome members of the public to interact with their artworks as they change over time. Williams aims to work within and outside of institutions to clarify, make transparent, and undo the many paradigms of oppression that exist around us. In doing so, they consistently oppose permanence in an effort to inspire more functional histories that liberate our communities and social spaces from colloquial history. One of the most relevant aspects of Williams' practice that I want to focus on today is their ongoing Wax Monument series. This collection of works began in miniature form, small, almost toy-sized recreations of colonial monuments that Williams made in order to comment on the normally untouchable nature of North American monuments. Think the big horse statues that you've seen around town, often with larger than life white male military figures that represented the quote, celebrated triumphs of our country's past. These large bronze, stone, or metal statues populate our public squares, parks, and communal spaces, but they are often fixed in time. They don't really change, and they often do not acknowledge the more problematic underbellies of the histories they are meant to preserve. For example, I think of the Egerton Ryerson sculpture that was recently toppled on campus at Ryerson University. This monument was fixed in time. It did not change as it was constructed to permanently preserve the legacy of this Canadian figure. That was until students and other members of the public toppled the statue this past June because of this Canadian educator's involvement in the original design of our country's infamous residential school system. The process now continues as a school known temporarily as, quote, X University attempts to change its name in separation from Ryerson's infamous political past. It is not my place to take a side in the debate on this name change, but I do believe Sandy Williams wants to comment on similar stories related to civic monuments in this series, imagining and developing new monuments to living history rather than erasing the old ones. These artworks are alive and transformative. They invite participation through the lighting of candles, mark making, and melting malleable historical symbols, rather than per permanent monumental constructions. They critique the history they are born from, without entirely erasing it. Williams has since expanded this series, creating large civic monuments out of wax with their own unique designs, rather than the miniature candle reconstructions of Williams' previous monuments. These large-scale series previously began in the Socrates Sculpture Park in Queens, New York last year. Rendered in black and white, Williams recreated a wax flag that is reminiscent of 
but not equivalent to, the U.S.'s own flag, an emblem of patriotism. Alive with transformative potential, this work invites participation, mark-making, melting, and molding of a malleable symbol. I think Sandy describes their work best, so I wanted to read for you their description of the work from the Socrates Sculpture Park's audio guide. I quote, I really hope that this message finds you well. If everything is working correctly, you should be looking at what may formerly be a six foot by 11 foot black and white wax flag. The base it stands on is a mulch map in the shape of what we might call queens. I started this wax monument series by making the form of historical monuments, turning them into little candles and widely distributing them. To make this fourth iteration of the series, I made its shape out of wood and cast it layer by layer over a series of weeks. I've made this flag as a sort of offering. Now it is our flag. I invite you to do what you want with it. To me, giving you agency with its object activates a sort of democracy that so many parts of our public lack, parts of our public where we lack agency, that I call unemancipated spaces. Giving people the power to determine an aspect of their aesthetic surroundings feels like a new sort of emancipation. Please melt this monument. Bring things and add to it, carve in it, tag it. Use your imagination as you put your hands on it, adding to the history of this object. Please meditate on what it means to be making history. Please be considerate. I hope everyone can feel comfortable here. As you can see, Williams gives back agency over these normally untouchable historical monuments. They push the limits of agency in public space by allowing others to participate in their artworks, transforming them into public spaces for living and changing monuments to our collective history over time. Now in the seventh installment of this series, Williams joins our park at the VAC. Here they want to emphasize how this wax monument can help root identity in the place where it comes from, home. Home and identities that are rooted in love, ancestors, loss, land, repression, representation, and violence, particularly in relation to the experience of Black Canadians. It can be difficult to acknowledge the painful histories of our past and present, but at this moment I must acknowledge the destructive impact that some far-right movements have enacted upon many racialized bodies and communities across this country and close to home in our own province of Ontario. Williams makes particular reference to historical symbols of the Ku Klux Klan in this monument via their research into many of the group's local chapters across southern Ontario. They make reference to many instances of this group's abuse of the cross throughout the 1900s, a time when the group refigured this symbol for their own agendas in pursuit of white supremacy. Unfortunately, remnants of the Klan have continued to resurface across Canada, mostly online. Canadian political scientist and contemporary historian Alan Bartley, a leading scholar in studies on the Ku Klux Klan in Canada, regretfully concludes that there is a seam of racism that runs through Canadian history, very wide and very deep. It's not always on display. It's actually quite artfully hidden in many cases. Sometimes it flows very clear on the surface, but other times it recedes and is almost invisible. But, he argues, that it has been there for a very long time, and insinuates that it will continue unless we start to do things to deal with problems such as far-right nationalism, or the dismantling of systems that support anti-Black racism in the future. Williams wants to reflect on these issues and problematic histories that threaten Black communities in Canada, offering popular symbols of hate back to the public to reclaim for new, safe, and inclusive futures. Now you can come to our grounds at the VAC and place your own mark onto this living monument. Williams invites you to melt it, carve into it, or otherwise interact with the sculpture to make new histories for this symbol as a united public community. You may even see some of the interactions that are already taking place with this work on your screens now. I look forward to watching how you can transform this work and add to its history yourselves if you have the opportunity to visit us in the future. The final installation in From the Earth We Grow is titled Arctic Char Steaks, a collection of three steel-cut fish steaks fabricated by the local Bowmanville artist Cuisine Van Heuvelen.
Hevelin is a contemporary Anuk artist, born in Iqaluit, Nunavut, though raised in southern Ontario. Their practice is rooted in the history and traditions of Inuit art, often working to stray away from its established art-making methods by incorporating a range of new fabrication processes. He received his BFA from York University in 2011 and his MFA from the Nova Scotia College of Art and Design in 2015. Hugh Vellen has previously recreated old Inuit technologies on a monumental scale to celebrate Inuit culture and expose its vernacular history to wider Canadian publics. For example, his series of monumental sized fishing lures or reimaginations of Avatuk balloons, each being objects that were traditionally used as hunting tools by many Inuit communities in the north. Huvelin explores these objects using modern materials such as mylar and steel to honor the traditions of his ancestors in the present through modern public sculpture. On the artworks, the artist writes, As far as living down south in Ontario, there was no reflection of myself or my culture. It is a challenge when the place you consider home, a Calouet, is not reflected back in the community you were living, Bowmanville, and rarely in other public spaces in Ontario. I only ever saw these objects inside my family's home. Our relation to things and objects fascinates me. I concern myself with a careful consideration of these objects, like a fishing lure or hunting implements or tools. They are important objects, functionally, but culturally as well. I can explore and think through each object as it represents more than just its physicality. I want you to read more into what the lure is, what it sustains, the rituals around it." Unquote. For Arctic char steaks, Hivelin offers a new water jet cut series of three steel fish steaks, cross sections of an Arctic char fish. The sculpture is made of untreated solid steel, a modern manufacturing material. Over time, this steel oxidizes in the outdoor elements, rusting in the rain and turning a bright orange color, similar to a charring fish steak. It is alive and changing as the seasons change and shift in the outdoor spaces around it. Food is important in Hugh Vellen's work. In general, it's something that brings everyone together. It gives people a sense of place and comfort, especially when you are far from home, like Hugh Vellen is from his familial community up north. He recalls the personal aspect of Inuit hunting and fishing in this work as well. Providing food is an essential practice in the north, a way of caring for each other in the community. The artist partly associates these stakes with his personal memory of family and fishing, spending the day together, sharing food and community, caring for one another. These country foods bring folks together. They are an important aspect of everyday life. On a deeper level, this work offers an accessible and non-confrontational way of thinking about issues of food sovereignty in the Canadian North. In this work, he highlights how access to food in Inuit communities is still so important, even more so in communities where the price of food is exorbitantly expensive. For example, NPR reported that a bushel of grapes transported for sale in Huvelin's hometown of Iqaluit cost $28.58, and a container of baby formula cost $26.99 in 2019. That is why, in a territory where about 84% of the population identifies as Inuit, country food, like the Arctic char sourced from fishing, is still the preferred source of sustenance. Inuit food security is a big issue across the North. Country food, like the Arctic char, is essential because of the high price of imported goods shipped from the South. Yet it is sometimes difficult to access and eat. At certain times of the year, it is some of the only consistent and healthy food available for a lot of people. With few other options for food harvesting locally, there is a lot of scrutiny about how, when, and what animals Inuit communities can harvest locally and eat. Communities in the north can become reliant on food to be transported in, which makes it very expensive and inaccessible to locals who often also face disproportionately high levels of economic poverty. Tracy Galloway, an associate professor of anthropology at the University of Toronto, Mississauga, has been studying food insecurity for nearly two decades in Nunavut. In the mid-2000s, she participated in a study on the health of the Inuit population living in the high Arctic, which found that 65% of households, including 71% of households with children, reported moderate to severe food insecurity. Almost 15 years later, not much has changed. 
just at the end of October 2021, you may have heard about a Kalowitz water crisis, as many media outlets in Ontario shared the news of a fuel contamination in the city's tap water supply. Clean water and healthy food are something which all people require, but when it comes to these Indigenous communities, we as treaty members in the land that we now know as Canada need to prioritize protection of the ecosystems and habitats where these local country foods are harvested. Food sovereignty and access to nutrients are a major and critical issue here that Hugh Vellin wants to highlight through easily accessible objects like fish steaks. Thank you for joining me to learn more about the Visual Arts Centre of Clarington and our exterior public art exhibition, From the Earth We Grow. I wanted to let you know that we also have multiple exhibitions that you can come and see inside of our gallery as well, all free of charge, though donations are appreciated. They rotate with new exhibitions multiple times a year, often with publications that are also available for free on our website. I hope we will cross paths with many of you again on site in the future, but until then, Take care and stay well. We'll see you soon.